Honorable Peter Bunting, Minister of National Security, Commissioner of Police, Mr. Owen Ellington, Mrs. Angela Patterson, Director of Corporate Services, Assistant Commissioner Kevin Blake, other senior officers of the JCF, officers, sub-officers, men and women of the JCF, the ICF, and the Rural Police, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen, a very pleasant good morning to you. As I indicated earlier, this ceremony is one in which the government of Jamaica, through the Ministry of National Security, and in particular the Minister, will hand over to the Commissioner of Police a number of vehicles to be used in our operational deployment to enhance the capacity of the forces response to crime and violence. I am quite sure that the Commissioner will speak and indicate to the Minister and indeed to the nation the usage of the vehicle and where they will be placed and how much it will assist the JCF in the pursuit of our strategic objectives. And equally one is hoping that the Minister will use also this opportunity to promise us some more vehicles and I'm quite sure that he will. Minister would indeed be happy for that. But we just want to say thanks anyway and appropriately to make those remarks will be our Commissioner of Police, Mr. Owen Ellington, and can I invite him now to the podium for his remarks. Thank you very much, um, Assistant Commissioner Rose, Honorable Minister, Mrs. Patterson, Senior Officers of the Police Force, Reverend, um, who said prayers for us earlier on, our friends from the media, and my fellow colleagues who are here representing the divisions and formations which would um, collect these vehicles here today. Uh, good morning to you. It is indeed a pleasure of mine to be here at this occasion where the Honorable Minister of National Security will formally hand over to the Jamaica Constabular Force a batch of service vehicles. I think it's about 39 uh, pickups to be deployed across Jamaica. Um, ACP Rose has indicated that these um, vehicles will be distributed to most of the operational formations across the force. And this is indeed the case because um, we recognize that the criminals that we are up against have become far more mobile. They have the resources to acquire uh, mobile assets to move themselves all around the country where they create crime and insecurity. And in order for the police to be ahead of them, if not on top of them, we need to continue to build out on force mobility, which is such a crucial capability for us in, in Jamaica today. Um, I would like to, um, as ACP Rose indicated earlier on, just tell the Honorable Minister and the rest of Jamaica what we intend to do with these vehicles. Um, we have plans to build out the patrol system in many of the territorial divisions and there are some new routes, overland routes, that we have actually assessed as being very important ones used by criminals who tra trans um, travel across the country that we intend to implement new patrol systems on them um, with these newly acquired assets. There are some police stations that have um, no vehicles and we intend to ensure that with this allocation and the additional vehicles that we expect in December that we should have every police station with a very new, fairly new, functional police vehicle um, as at uh, later on this year. There are some formations that already have vehicles and we intend to add some of these to them. For example, the um, territorial divisions in the corporate area that have to build out their patrol formations to cope with the um, growing challenge of mobile criminals, they too will be allocated um, additional vehicles. I must say that I am very concerned, Minister, and I have expressed it over and over about the way in which some of our members treat with the service vehicles which are allocated. I use every opportunity presented to me to remind them of the huge cost incurred by taxpayers whenever a batch of vehicles is allocated to the police force. I think this batch represents the first tranche of well over $300 million worth of investment by the government and taxpayers of this country to keep us mobile. 
Um, there are some police stations where the value, the cost of the police vehicle exceeds the value of the physical station to which it's attached. But when you consider the force multiplier effect of a functional vehicle at a police station, it way exceeds what the station itself as a physical plant can deliver to the community. And I want the members to understand that without the ability to move around in the community efficiently and to respond to public calls for help, to patrol, to observe, to detect crimes and to reassure the citizens, a police station in the district is basically useless. So you need mobility. And when we invest in the kind of vehicles that we are providing to you to do your work out there, it is incumbent on you to care the vehicles, to use them for the purpose for which they are intended, and to ensure that no unauthorized business is conducted with these vehicles. In this regard, I have asked Assistant Commissioner Nelson from the administration branch not only to republish the instructions for safe operations of these types of vehicles in this week's force orders, but we are also ensuring that each police man, each police driver who is here today to collect a vehicle on behalf of his division is personally issued a copy of those safe driving instructions. I am always prepared to hold persons individually accountable for the way in which they use and treat force assets. Um, the issue of breathalyzing our members when they are involved in certain matters has come up recently. I'd like to use this occasion to publicly state that after every accident involving police vehicle, we, we require as part of the investigations that the officers be breathalyzed. I am very, very serious about it. And if it means we have to go a step further and, and conduct drug tests, we will do it because we have to ensure that in the handling of these vehicles, not only do drivers consider their own safety, but the safety of passengers who may be colleagues and the safety of other users of the, of the roads. So as we accept these vehicles today, Honorable Minister, let me uh, say thanks to you personally and to the ministry that you lead. Let me say thanks to the government for allocating the funds to purchase these vehicles. Um, it's very interesting that these funds are made available in April of this year, but we are just today collecting the first batch of, of vehicles. Government money is indeed very hard to spend, and um, I hope we can find an easier way to spend um, additional funds as they come our way, because we really need the vehicles in the fleet. Let me say thanks to Assistant Commissioner Rose, Mrs. Patterson, um, the staff of the Transport and Repairs Division, and all who had anything to do with the acquisition of these vehicles and getting them here today. And let me thank in advance the commanding officers, men and women of the various formations that will get these vehicles for the safe, careful use, handling of these motor vehicles so that they can last for a long time and they can enable you to provide the quality of service that our publics so desperately deserve of us. Thanks again, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great day. But ladies and gentlemen, the whole issue of vehicles and uh, vehicle procurement and, and force mobility uh, was one that was impressed upon me very early in my tenure as minister by the commissioner of police. And last year we did a number of measures um, which I think increased the efficiency um, or assisted in increasing the efficiency of the transport and repairs division and whose productivity uh, increased sharply after those interventions. Uh, we have also invested significantly in uh, mobility. Uh, last year we supplied more vehicles to the security forces and in this sense, I include the JDF as well as the correctional services. Uh, we supplied more vehicles last year than had been supplied to them in the prior three years combined. Um, this year, we're continuing that because we want to make this a, a, a constant so that over time, the average age of the police fleet, which when I became minister was uh, just about 10 years, in fact, I think half of the vehicles were over 10 years. 
and that suggests to you that um, it's a vehicle well past its economic uh, useful life because a police vehicle unlike a domestic vehicle is literally on the road um, three shifts a day or, or two at least two shifts a day and therefore a 10 year old vehicle in a police service would be equate to something like a 25 or 30 year old vehicle uh, for domestic purposes. Um, a little over a month ago I made a statement to the House of Representatives that we had placed orders for 70 motor cars, 6 mid-sized SUVs, 44 pickups and 13 600cc motorbikes as well as 215-seater buses. I indicated then that delivery would start within a month and it should be complete by the end of the year. And so this first handover uh, represents the first tranche of those vehicles, in particular uh, the pickups, the double cab 4x4 pickups. And one of the things I also want to point out is that you may have noticed since last, between last year and this year, uh, the motorbikes that we are acquiring for the police are much more substantial motorbikes, um, 600 cc uh, bikes, engines, and with a proper police kit, lights and sirens. And while this is, uh, in a sense, less effective in terms of the numbers of units that we can afford but I think the tragic loss of Constable Davis a few weeks ago in Trelawney points to the fact that from the perspective of officer safety it doesn't make sense to compromise in buying these little um, you know 200 cc motorbikes where that don't carry sirens and lights and then expect an officer to carry out the same duties um, with that as you know a proper outfitted police bike with a proper engine size with sirens and lights to alert the public and the road users that the police officer may be coming and may be coming at speed in pursuit um, of a fugitive or in terms of piloting uh, other vehicles through the traffic. So this is an important investment. Um, it probably means that we will acquire the, the, the numbers over time rather than more quickly. But I think both from a, um, an effectiveness in operation point of view, from an officer safety perspective, um, it is an investment that is well worth it. We, our efforts to equip the police force isn't limited, however, to, uh, to force mobility and vehicles. We, the cabinet just approved an upgrade of the uh, automated palm and fingerprint identification system which will see us spending, again, um, substantial amounts of money, uh, between two and three million US dollars, upgrading the capability of, of that system. And it hopefully, as a result, improving the detection um, rate of, of criminals from forensic evidence, and also improving the conviction rate um, as we will have to rely less on weakness evidence and more on forensic evidence collected and crime scene um, uh, evidence. Last year, the police were able to report a sharp increase in the recovery of firearms and that has continued in the co current year. Um, this applies to narcotics as well and we see an excellent um, effort in terms of uh, the activities of the police, in terms of the number of uh, vehicle checkpoints, in terms of the numbers of raids, 
from all perspectives, from human trafficking uh, perspective, right across to interrupting narcotics trafficking gang activity. Nonetheless, you are aware that the last three months we have seen a spike in murders and it shows that we have to, we can't become complacent. We have to redouble our efforts. As important as vehicles, equipment and personnel because we've also seen a substantial uh, increase in the numbers of police personnel over the last five years or so. We've seen about a 25% increase in the aggregate numbers between JCF, ISCF and district constables. However, equipment, vehicles, personnel, while all necessary, are not sufficient. It also requires committed police officers who are willing to put themselves in harm's way to protect the lives and property of our citizens. And it also requires a supportive society because I, after uh, just short of two years now um, as minister, I'm convinced that the police efforts by themselves will never reduce crime to where we need it to go until we have a supportive uh, set of institutions within government right across the chain of law enforcement and we have supportive communities and a supportive media and a supportive private sector and a supportive NGO community to include faith-based groups. When we get all of that when we get all of those interest groups engaged, then I think we're really, we will really start to see some significant progress in reducing the levels of crime and violence and increasing citizens' perception of their safety and security.